Welcome uh, to the Chashak Wing Museum. Uh, hi everyone online. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the fact that we're gathered today on Gadigal land in the Eora Nation. This is land that was never ceded as Aboriginal land all around Australia, and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future as we get together today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Candice Richards and I'm the Assistant Curator here at the Nicholson Collection in the Chowchak Wing Museum. Uh, that is our Antiquities and Archaeology Collection. And I'm really excited about today's event and excited to be able to welcome Associate Professor Sarah Bond to join us online here uh, to talk about one of her passionate uh, research projects. Uh, Sarah is an ancient historian that thinks about uh, the late Roman Mediterranean world. Uh, she publishes regularly online to public audiences, and that's how I've gotten to know Sarah, mainly through her very active Twitter account, and I suggest that you do follow her. Um, she's really interested in making sure that everybody has access to the knowledge that we create about the ancient world. She's also very uh, passionate about uh, the experience of ancient, ancient marginal peoples, and that's drawn her into a lot of really interesting research projects uh, that formed her book. Uh, trade and taboo disreputable professionals in the ancient Mediter in the Roman Mediterranean and I suggest you all give that a very cracking good read. Um, so I won't go on too much about Sarah except to say uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, we'll give a talk to Sarah, there'll be a quick Q&A after before we get into the second part of today's event where I'll introduce F uh, Peter Phillip from Weiwu Brewery uh, to talk about some experimental archaeology that he's been working on uh, in consultation with Sarah. So take it away, Sarah, and thanks so much for zooming in late at night from the States for us. Thank you so much for having me. I want to say a big thank you to everybody there. I wish I was there with you. I have a, a beer waiting for after the talk uh, for me to have along with you guys, but I wish I could taste the Roman beer along with you. I did want to say thank you so much to the Chow Chalk Wing Museum, to Candace, to Craig, um, to Peter, to everyone that put this together, as well as my good friend, James Flexner, who is um, also a professor there. We lost him from America to Australia. So uh, I wanted to introduce this talk simply by saying that I specialize in ancient artisans. I love professionals. I love the labor unions that they create. And I am especially interested in people who are doing things that sometimes are on the margins of the Roman economy. And as we're going to talk about today, especially within the Greek and Roman worlds, beer was not always seen as something that was the reputable beverage, that was the beverage of choice for those who were quote unquote civilized. Um, so brewers uh, came to my attention when I began to work in Milwaukee at a university called Marquette University. And I noticed that everybody wanted to hear about brewers when I talked about my disreputable professionals. And so uh, really a lot of this talk came from partnering with breweries in Milwaukee and then here in Iowa at Big Grove Brewery, um, and now uh, partnering with Wayward. So I'm just really excited that we can talk a little bit about the history of beer. So what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about that history, and then to hand it over for Q&A and to hopefully have some samples. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, can everybody see this? Is that good? Can actually see everything. Yeah, all good. Good. Wonderful. Okay. So we're not going to talk about hops until we get to the very end of this talk because as we will see, there are no IPAs and no hoppy beers in the ancient world. And so let us take all of our visions of these double IPAs and hopped up beers that are so popular at this moment and put it out of our line of vision uh, until the last few slides when we get into the medieval period. But alcohol was incredibly popular within the ancient world. Uh, in the year 2021, a report came back that ceramics in southern China had shown that possibly the earliest brewing processes that we know about um, are evident in ceramics in southern China from about 7,000 BCE. Uh, and we also know that 
At the same time, um, about 2000 years later in a different area of um, the area of modern day Iran in the Fertile Crescent, uh, there were also people that were inventing the beverage that we call beer today. Although as we're gonna talk about, it was very different um, than the types of beers that we enjoy at this moment. Uh, but drinking was a very convivial thing. It was something that oftentimes had to do certainly with parties and with hanging out, but also had a religious aspect to it um, as well in many contexts. Although most people are most familiar with things like the symposium within the context of Greek civilization, um, that is focused much more on wine. Um, and as we are going to talk about today, uh, oftentimes we know that Romans looked down on those who drank beer as their primary beverage of choice, uh, even though certain civilizations like Egypt and areas within the ancient Near East oftentimes enjoyed beer on a very regular basis as part of their quotidian experience daily. Now, winemaking was seen as something that was extremely uh, civilized, and I, every time I use that, just imagine I have air quotes here, for those within the Greek world and within the Roman world. And the Greeks began cultivating grapes probably around 3000 BCE, and viticulture became extremely standard probably around the 8th century BCE. So right around the time when uh, Homer may be speaking the Iliad and the Odyssey is really when we see a lot of viticulture um, taking hold and something that is becoming a bit more industrialized. Um, wine was extremely popular, and as you can see here, it's represented in a lot of ancient art, uh, and we know a lot from archaeology. Uh, probably the world's expert in viticulture and wine presses um, is a man named Imlin Dodd, who is at the British School in Rome, um, and we have many of these wine presses for grapes that are across the ancient Mediterranean that tell us a lot about the different types of wine um, that were very popular. One type of wine that I want to point out that we're going to talk more about a little bit later is one uh, in Latin called conditum, which is a type of spiced wine. And this is wine that oftentimes had honey, date, could have a little pepper and fennel within it. Um, as well as uh, a little bit of saffron at times. And so oftentimes Romans are going to be, uh, as well as the Greeks, cutting their wine into uh, two parts water and one part wine, um, and then also adding various spices in order to, to make it um, a little more zesty, let's say. Another beverage that was very popular in the ancient world was ancient mead. Um, now, ancient mead is water, honey, and wild yeast. And we are told this from various ancient sources, like a man named Columella. And we know that, for instance, there are very small scale ceramic apiaries, that is to say, um, where bees are being raised and their honey taken out. But we also know about larger scale industrial, we might say, uh, I um, apiaries for collecting honey, and probably one of the most famous you can see here is from the island of Malta, which is right near Sicily. Um, and mead was something that was extremely popular, as we'll see within um, the areas of modern day Germany and in uh, Celtic culture, um, but also was, was something that was drank within many other areas of the Mediterranean. Now, beer uh, is something that I became interested in, as I say, when I began living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because we are very obsessed with brewers um, in Milwaukee, because that is where Miller Brewing is located. Um, I began to meet a lot of the beer scientists that were working um, at a place called Lakefront Brewery. And this is the same brewery that would team up a little bit later on with Bettina Arnold, who is a professor at UW-Milwaukee. 
Milwaukee to make a Celtic inspired beer that was scraped off of the bottom of ceramics that were excavated from her site from the fifth century BCE. Um, and so there are a lot of people, especially in the area of the Midwest, who are very interested in what we call reconstructive archaeology. That is to say, um, people who are looking at chemical analysis, especially of the residues on ceramics, that is to say, amphorae that we're going to look at in just a little bit, and other types of ceramics in order to see if we can try and reverse engineer some of the recipes, because we don't have uh, a lot of the exact recipes for many of these drinks. Oftentimes, the um, percentages and um, the amounts are not told to us. We just have to work on the different types of ingredients that are given to us from biochemical analysis or from scant literary sources like a man named Apicius, uh, who writes a, a cookbook in the second century CE, or from Columella, um, or from various mentions by, by other people. Now, beer is different depending on where you are in the Mediterranean. And probably one of the world's experts on this um, is a Canadian named Max Nelson, who wrote a wonderful book that if you want to buy it, it's called The Barbarian Beverage. And one of the things that he points out um, is that the types of beer that are being drank are very different, especially in areas of Gallia. Uh, that's where we're going to focus on, especially tonight. Um, they're oftentimes drinking lots of different types of beer, barley, wheat, as we'll discuss. Um, they have a type of honey beer. Uh, and if you look in areas of ancient Egypt, which is really domesticating and, and um, using brewers around probably the year 3500 BCE forward, um, you're getting uh, a lot of emmer beers, you're getting a lot of millet, as well as barley um, in the area of Egypt. Um, if we look towards India, for instance, they're drinking more of a rice beer. So depending on where you are, you're going to have a lot of differentiations, not only in the alcohol content that we'll discuss, um, but also in uh, the consistency of the beers. So Sumerian beer, for instance, we are told they are oftentimes drank out of straws because it's such a, a thick mash that's left along with the actual beer itself, whereas um, uh, it seems that Egyptian beer was a little clearer and less chunky, let's say, to, to drink. Um, but most of these beers would be much more closer to the beers that we would consider today to be an ale. A, a lager is not going to, to come until the 16th century. There are no stouts, there are no porters, there are no IPAs. So all of these are kind of a version of what we might consider today to be an ale. Now, um, I think that many of the brewers in the audience, this will seem very simplistic, but I just want to kind of break down some of the elements that you need in order to actually brew a beer. Um, now, Romans are very much dependent, um, and all of the, the groups that we're talking about today on what we call spontaneous fermentation, because yeast is all around us. Yeast is surrounding us, even though we can't see it. It's in the air that we are breathing at this very very moment. Um, and so uh, what the, is happening oftentimes is that you have malted barley, wheat, or millet, and you need a sugar to go along with that. Um, and so you're going to have the maltose that is created from the malting process, but also you may want to hasten some of the fermentation a little bit later on by adding other sugars like those from a little bit of honey or a little bit of fruit. You also need water. Um, you need that spontaneous yeast, you need the fermentation and CO2 in order to make the beer. Um, so all of these elements are there. Um, and uh, even though we don't have large scale uh, industrial processes like we do today at say Miller Brewing or Budweiser, there are still, as we are going to see, um, very large areas for processing and creating beers for thousands of people within the community. 
Now, I mentioned the Egyptians before, um, and the Egyptians are incredible brewers of beer. Um, probably around the year 3500 or thereabouts, we have um, brewing and we have a number of dioramas, which is what you saw on the talk for today in the um, flyer that we sent out. Um, these dioramas oftentimes come very preserved because they are within a tomb context. And so these are funerary contexts that show us brewers actually um, working with the bread, um, doing the mash, sealing them inside of uh, ceramic vessels. Um, and this one in particular is now at the Met Museum in New York City, but is from uh, Mentu Hotep II's tomb. And so you can see the brewers here doing their work because if you're going to go to the afterlife uh, and you want to surround yourself with the people and with the various elements that you want to take with you, I think everyone in the room and myself included, I don't want to be in an afterlife that doesn't have beer in it. Um, so uh, this is what these brewers are preparing and recreating in the tomb so that the pharaoh can take beer with them to the afterlife. Other evidence that we have for beer, especially in this period um, of, let's say, Ptolemaic Egypt, then into the period that we call Roman Egypt, is a number of papyri that tell us that, for instance, um, there are taxes on beer, that there are a number of what we might call large-scale breweries that are providing beer for communities, um, and that this beer ranges usually between 6 and 12 percent in alcohol percentage. So oftentimes high alcohol content beers are going to be drunk at especially very large religious festivals. Um, uh, you might have it at a funeral, get out your fancy 12 percenter, whereas on a day-to-day -day basis for young children and for people who um, are just having it as a beverage in their everyday life in order to get sustenance and caloric intake, it's probably going to be more of a six to seven percent beer, which is probably a normal uh, IPA uh, when, when you drink one in the States at least. So a number of recipes and mentions of beer um, come from these papyri that have been preserved because Egypt is such an arid climate that these papyri survive to us today. Now, I mentioned before, my former colleague when I worked at Marquette, and I'm now at the University of Iowa, um, her name is Bettina Arnold. And you can see Bettina excavating here at an Iron Age burial mound in southwest Germany. Um, and she has worked especially on drinking horns, one of which you can see here. Um, and these drinking horns were something that were very much tied to ritual and uh, to religious festivals, but they work not all that differently than many other what we call in the States beer bongs, as we will see, that they are something that is a funnel for a lot of times you can put in wine, you can put in mead, or you can put in beer. And a number of them have been excavated oftentimes from uh, burial mounds and, and from funereal contexts. And Bettina has worked an incredibly hard uh, uh, worked for an, a long and hard time on reconstructing ancient mead um, and, and honeyed beers especially. Here are some Near Eastern raita. Um, the drinking horn it, in its formal spelling in Greek um, is a raiton uh, in the singular and raita in the plural. And we have a number of these um, examples, for instance, from the Getty Villa that you can see in uh, Los Angeles um, and many other places. They're oftentimes made of silver, extremely ornate. And you notice you can't set them down without them falling over because the point is for you to hold them up and um, to either have others help you or to drink directly uh, out of them. And as I said, uh, you know, oftentimes the Greeks are drinking wine out of these rather than drinking beer, although we have evidence in especially Germany and areas of Switzerland and modern France and Celtic Rita, um, the ones that are especially for um, the, the Greek world oftentimes are being held with wine rather than with beer. 
But it's not all that different than what we do today. This is John Kerry coming to my state of Iowa in 2006 um, and drinking it in a very traditional college Iowa manner. Um, we have a lot of football here, um, American football, and this is our traditional ritual when we invite people to the state to drink our beers. Now, um, a lot of people tend to ask me what uh, we do in terms of me medicine and beer, whether Romans and Greeks believed that beer was something that was needed in order to um, solve any of their medical problems. And uh, there has been a, a lot written about um, various uses of hops, but Romans tend to eat hops kind of like asparagus. It's kind of eaten as a vegetable, um, um, something that you might boil and you would eat. And if you've ever had a hop, it's it's rather bitter if you just bite into it. Um, but you can cook them and eat them. But Romans are not using them in beer. And in fact, oftentimes, if you look at the uh, writings of many medical writers within the Greek world, they see beer, especially as feminizing, something that is turning you um, either into something that is more barbarian, um, who are connoted very heavily with beer, um, or turning you more into something that was seen as womanly. Now, um, he's not, uh, beer is not mentioned within the writings of Hippocrates, but we know that, for instance, beer is being mentioned within the medical writings of a man named Galen, who was living in the second century CE within the Roman Empire. Um, and he also is mentioning this kind of rumor that beer makes you more feminine. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics, not just of what beer is and how it is made, but also about some of the uh, vessels that are used for these drinks and its transport, as well as the actual people that are making it. Um, in terms of wine, we know that both wine and beer are transported within ceramic vessels, oftentimes on ships, which are, uh, these vessels are called amphorae, and they're made out of um, ceramic, and they they're very easy to be transported in a ship because you can use um, crossed ropes in order to go through those handles that you see and to really secure them into the bottom of a ship hold. Um, now it's very hard to then keep that amphora upright when you actually move it onto land. And so oftentimes you have a special holder for an amphora to keep it upright, um, or you may even transfer it to a different vessel um, in order to then drink the beverage from. But we have a number of wine vessels um, that tell us uh, a little bit about where wine was being drunk as opposed to where beer was more often drunk. Now, um, especially in around the first century BCE within the Roman Mediterranean, we get more and more evidence and mentions of something called a kupa. Um, and if you know anybody with the last name Cooper in your life, then you probably are aware that uh, Cooper comes from the Latin for a barrel maker, a cuparius. And so these barrel makers began to become extremely popular because beer in a barrel was much more easy to transport, especially to areas where there is high volume of drinking beer. And one of the highest volume areas where beer was in demand was oftentimes near Roman forts. So a lot of the evidence, for instance, that we have within Roman Britain for people drinking beer and transporting it come from forts along Hadrian's Wall, um, where people are saying, oh, you know, the soldiers are running out of beer, send beer, send it quickly. And so sending it in a barrel oftentimes was a lot easier than maybe sending um, a multiplicity of amphorae. Uh, this is a Roman barrel from Barhill Roman Fort um, that is in Scotland, so beyond Hadrian's Wall, and uh, it has an inscription um, for the person that was probably the Cuparius. And we also have a number of Cupa burials that became very popular um, for those individuals in Roman Iberia um, who were using barrels for transport as well. Um, we also have a lot of archaeological evidence for beer and 
for the processes. Um, this is a T-shaped drying oven that you would use um, when you were preparing for uh, brewing the beer. And we have a number of them from across the Mediterranean world uh, that tell us that these specialized T-shaped ovens are being used, especially by brewers. And again, these brewers are oftentimes following demand and demand oftentimes is by the troops that are Roman soldiers, but also in high areas where beer is extremely popular. And as we'll see, that is oftentimes along the Rhine, uh, along the Rhine River in modern day Germany. But we have a cluster of inscriptions that tell us about uh, the particular types of Roman brewers who are called cervasarii. And if you've heard the word in Spanish, cerveza, um, it is the same thing in Latin. A cerveza is simply a type of oftentimes a wheat beer that is specifically being made in the areas of Gaul, which is one of the Roman provinces, as well as within Roman Britannia um, and modern day Scotland. We have account records, we have epitaphs for many of these brewers, and it seems as though um, they are uh, really addressing the supply um, or, and the demand through their, their beer that they are brewing um, within the areas of the northern provinces. Now, something that I also want to mention is that just because you're a brewer doesn't mean that you're not doing other things with your life, that you can have uh, a side hustle, you can have multiple hustles uh, at the same time and be an expert. And one thing that there is a lot of crossover with um, is the fact that if you are very experienced in the use of that, and the use of boilers, and especially in the use of um, what we might call um, these, these heating vats that we have a lot of evidence for from Pompeii, uh, you may also be brewing beer at the same time as doing other things. And so we have a little bit of evidence for that from epitaphs. One such one is a soldier of the German fleet who was both a dealer of beer and also was a dyer. So um, if you are dyeing textiles, you are working specifically um, with the dyeing of them in these large vats. What I think and what many others think who work with fulleries, for instance, um, within the area of Pompeii, is that if you uh, are, are knowledgeable about these areas and you already have the kind of um, industrial mechanisms that allow you to do one, it's not that hard to do another as well. So I think that a lot of people are home brewing, um, many women and also men are brewing beer in their homes in very small batches. But if you're brewing for a larger resale on the wholesale market, um, then you might also be dyeing textiles. You may also be fulling in your home, that is to say cleaning textiles that have gotten dirty. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of crossover between these crafts and artisans within the, the same milieu. Now, some of the people that are not only making beer and making wine, there are also businessmen whose job it is to sell it to various people across the Roman Mediterranean. People who sell wine are called vinarii, people who sell vino, essentially. And the people who sell beer are the servisarii or negotiatores. It's where we get the word negotiation from, is the word for business in Latin. And uh, we have a lot of evidence, especially up here in the areas of the Rhine, along what is uh, the Rhineland today, for various brewers who are getting into boats and loading up their boats with barrels of beer um, and selling it along the riverside to various communities. So the wine is clustering, especially in the Italic Peninsula and along what we would say is today Southern France, whereas a lot of the evidence for brewers um, is in the area of the Northern provinces um, and in the areas of Gaul. Um, I haven't focused on Roman Egypt, but throughout this time period, Egypt is continuing to drink beer and not to stigmatize it in the way that Romans do um, in other areas. Now, um, especially within the area of Trier in modern day Germany, we have a lot of evidence for these brewers, as well as businessmen who then again take the beer and then sell it 
uh, on the wholesale market um, who are taking it to different areas. So lots and lots of epitaphs that mention that they are brewers and that they are proud of the product that they are creating. And where are they actually then selling this beer? Um, well, if they are selling it at local fairs and, and the what we call the, the Noondinal Fair that comes every nine days, that's wonderful. But they're oftentimes selling it in a city to a taberna. That is to say a tavern. It's where we get the modern word tavern from. And we have uh, thousands of these tabernae that are across the Mediterranean that we know that both wine and beer was being sold in. And of course, some of our best evidence for the drinking of wine and beer is within the context of the very well-preserved cities around the Bay of Naples, especially the city of Pompeii. Here is uh, a map that was created by an archaeologist named Stephen Ellis at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and as you can see, Bars are everywhere in a city that probably only had a population of 20,000. Um, so you can see, especially along the main uh, axis, axes within the roads of Pompeii, you have bars and taverns and inns that are dotting throughout so that you're never very far, um, whether you're at the amphitheater or the theater or whether you're at your home, you're always going to be somewhat close to a beer. And I would say, also very close to a brothel when you are in the area of Pompeii. And oftentimes this beer is going to be served to you uh, by a waiter or a waitress. Oftentimes the innkeepers and their wives um, would own an inn and employ waitresses. Uh, that would be called over to give you a ceramic cup, which you guys are going to have in just a little bit when we begin to try uh, our own Roman beers. So we have a ceramic cup here and she's holding a little small, um, lo looks to be ceramic vessel. Um, and uh, her patrons are saying, over here, no, that's mine. And she responds, who Whoever wants it should take it. Oceanus, come over here and get a drink. And this is from graffiti at Pompeii um, that is, is very much what everyday life uh, in a bar, either called a taberna or a calpona, would be like. And these drinking vessels are also meant to amuse you and to tell you a little bit about the beverages that they're drinking. So this is a very uh, famous inscribed late Roman ceramic uh, that is has an inscription on the back and on the front and it's from Roman Gaul it's today uh, in Paris and on it inscribed it says waitress fill my flask with wheat beer that is to say the cerveza that we mentioned earlier tavern keeper do you have spiced wine that is to say the conditum that we mentioned earlier this kind of peppery peppery wine fill give um, so these speaking inscriptions are amusing to people as they're drinking out of these vessels that they're telling the waitress, like, come over and fill my beer up for me. We also have a number of amusing epitaphs that tell us a little bit about the inn experience, about going to a bar in the ancient world, um, and the fact that oftentimes taverns were on the bottom, a calpona or a taberna on the bottom, and then you may have the rooms of the inn up above, um, and you may even have what we might consider a manger, that is to say a place for, for various animals to uh, be fed and to give water that is out back. And so um, inns and bars go kind of hand in hand with each other and are oftentimes uh, also being used as brothels as well. Now, when you're done uh, drinking and you want to start having a new drink um, or you want to welcome people to a party, Romans also engaged in a, a lot of cheersing, um, a lot of telling people that they needed to drink their beverage in order to live longer. So it's very much in the same spirit uh, today when you are, say, um, in, in Italy and they tell you salute, um, you're talking about your health because you're drinking this beverage in hopes of it making you heart heartier and healthier for the future. So I've included a few of my favorite below, dignitas amicorum paesetes vivas, worthy among your friends, drink that you may live, may you live. Then we also have bibe multis anis, 
drink that you may live for many years, which is a good one for people's birthdays. Um, and I would say for the for the new year, oftentimes is is very common. And you oftentimes have them at the bottom of the drinking cup, right? So that you've done the actual oral recitation of the salud, but then you drink it all and you see a little surprise at the bottom that tells you um, about the people and, and about the, the uh, cheers that you've just done. Okay, in this last part here, as I'm concluding my remarks, and we're actually getting to the beer part, which is what I know we are all here for, um, I just want to talk a little bit about this transition to the Middle Ages, because we haven't talked uh, a lot about women in the ancient world, and we haven't talked a lot about the fact that we know that women were brewers in ancient Rome. We have a number of epitaphs um, that tell us uh, about a servisaria. Uh, these are female brewers, but this number increases, especially with the number of monastic establishments well into the medieval period. And as you can see here, drinking games, just like the one that Hercules plays at the very beginning of this talk, um, don't go out of fashion. People are still drinking, people are still imbibing beer, but actually um, beer begins to outpace the amount of wine that is being drunk, especially in the areas of the Carolingian Empire, that is to say the, the Frankish Empire, um, as well as in areas uh, to the north. And we begin to have much more evidence um, in the actual maps of these breweries, the fact that monks are taking over and perfecting it along with nuns. Um, so uh, later on in, in the period, um, especially of the 12th, cen 12th century, we will have very famous uh, women like Hildegard von Bingen within the area of the Rhine who is brewing beer and believes hops to be medicinal. Um, but it's right in this period of a, probably about the ninth century in the Carolingian Empire that we begin to see uh, that, that hops are more and more used. And probably one of the earliest mentions we have is Pepin the Short, who is Charlemagne's father, uh, mentions that he is gifting hop gardens over um, to Saint-Denis. And Saint-Denis, essentially, we think that these hop gardens are beginning to be used as hops begin to be seen as preservatives. Because one thing about Roman beer that is very difficult is that it doesn't last very long. There aren't a ton of preservatives that are being added to this beer. Um, and so what they find is that the more hops you add, the longer a beer can last. And of course, this is how we eventually, many years later, get India Pale Ale, because it can last all the way in the shipment to India because it's been preserved with so many hops inside of it. And so even uh, the maps of the monasteries that we're starting to get show us that uh, people are learning about hops, that they are growing it more and more, and that these monasteries in particular are leaning on beer as an economic prowess and including them um, even within uh, their monastic plans. Now, I don't have time to talk about the modern history of beer um, and all of the, the wonderful, rich history, especially in the United States and in Britain um, and in Australia that that includes, um, but it, it goes to show just in this picture um, that really beer is not just a standalone product that can be made on its own. Uh, this is something that requires people, it requi requires skill, it requires craft. It's something that should be respected all the way from the brewer that is making it uh, to the farmers that are growing uh, these different types of, of grains that are be using, even to the coopers and to the monks that, that are then um, working to, to package it. So um, from kind of Tip to stern, we have here a, a, a wonderful um, process and a wonderful beverage, but there are a lot more to think about um, than, just, uh, than just the end product that we are going to have today. And of course, the most important thing about beer, I would say, um, is that it is enjoyed with other people, that it is something that always enhances a party, um, something that when done responsibly, it brings people together 
together. And so um, even though we don't want uh, any of the um, party tricks that were pulled by Hercules, uh, we do still want to come together and to celebrate the fact that these are delicious beverages that are best enjoyed all together. And so I'm very thankful that we, uh, even though I am virtual, are all together and, and going to now try a wonderful beverage. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more um, from the brewer himself. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that whirlwind to her through uh, beer drinking and wine drinking as well, which I was uh, happy to see the variety of different types of uh, people and industry and all of the kind of uh, technology, but also the people that go into these kinds of things. So thank you so much, Sarah. We have a couple of minutes for a few questions, if there's any. Um, if anybody in the room would like to ask a question, I will repeat it back to Sarah with the microphone on. Uh, but in addition to that, I would like to say before I get to question and answers that many of the vessels that Sarah showed are actually on display in our museum as well. So after this, go and have a look around, especially level two, to find all of the different types of drinking vessels that you can find. Um, so, oh, that's no keg stand is one of the first questions. So we'll move on, I think. Um, <laughs> and a very opinionated Galen was a quack uh, from our online audience there, but in the room. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, any idea about what the capacity of the Roman barrels were? Right. Uh, well, they, 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 um, you know, they vary kind of widely because there's no standardization of a cupa within the ancient world. But the one that I showed you before, I have to go and check my notes, but I want to say it's around 60 gallons. I will have to, to check, um, but they come in kind of a smaller cupa and then larger ones, but there's no standardization for, for any of them within the ancient world. It's not the same as weights and measures, which we have a little bit more of an idea of the, the standardization of like, you know, what each unit of volume was within uh, many of, or at least the ideal for them within the ancient world. But yeah, barrels weren't standardized to that, to that same level that they are today. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions from the room? Yes. Uh, would you like to comment on the pochine from uh, potatoes that the Celts uh, from Ireland uh, often made? Do you have any commentary about potato beer and potato booze? Uh no, I don't because Romans don't have potatoes and they don't have um, tomatoes and they don't have chocolate and they don't have cocoa. They don't have sugar. They don't have cotton. Uh, cotton is only a very small portion. So a lot of the, the what we might call new world products that are very common um, to you were not common to Romans. So no spaghetti sauce, for instance, no spaghetti, uh, a lot of <laughs> A lot of things, there's no um, fermented, like we know that the process of distillation, for instance, is already known, um, but usually it's being, distillation is being used to make perfume. It's not being used to make hard liquor. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of opinions on potatoes because my Romans, um, they did not have them. So sadly, that that's not uh, an area of my of my expertise, but I am in full support of, of the potato as someone married. <laughs> to, um, uh, who is a uh, person who has very deeply studied James Joyce for many years and has a PhD <laughs> in it. I greatly, greatly respect the potato. So uh, Sarah doesn't know me very well, but I do not respect the potato. So this is a fun, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just wow. not a potato fan. Uh, yes, so yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
because I've got to relay this, so I'm going to stop you there. Um, uh, interested in the bittering agents and if hops was used and known to be used as a bittering agent and how that might compare to, say, the Chinese examples where uh, bitter melon can be used as also as a bittering agent. So if you have any commentary around that. And then we'll have one more question before we get to the actual uh, brewing side of things. Yeah, I mean, Romans add a lot of herbs and spices. So I mentioned pepper, but pepper is a, a very expensive spice to be adding at this time, right? Because pepper is being important, imported from the Arabian Peninsula as well as from India. So we have peppercorns in the latrines in Pompeii and across many other areas of the Mediterranean. So that's oftentimes going to be what, what is being added along with fennel. We have bay leaves that oftentimes are being added, um, a little bit of saffron. And if you've ever had Dogfish Heads beer that is called Midas Touch, and I think it is pretty much available worldwide, then you know that saffron beer is very expensive because Midas Touch is, is like, I think $10 a bottle when you buy it. Um, but that is a beer from Gordion in Turkey. So there are no hops in Roman beers, um, but they do have a lot of spices that are being added in various ways. And that's why um, oftentimes you have a strainer, and I didn't show you guys a strainer, but for both wine and beer, oftentimes what you want to do is you want to put the strainer over top of your drinking cup, and you pour the beer through it so that all of that spicing agent um, is going to be kind of cut out before you drink it. Um, we mentioned straws before. Straws are something that, that are uh, pretty normalized throughout the, the ancient world, but um, at the same time, if you want to drink it directly, then you probably should strain it first. So yeah, um, no hops, but definitely a little fennel in there um, and a little bit of bay leaf that you would want to remove uh, before you actually drank it. So it's chunkier beer, guys. It's, it's a chunky your beer that doesn't have quite the flavor to it that modern beer does and so yeah it's it's not whenever I have people actually drink kind of beer that that is much more in a Roman style it seems a lot plainer than the beers that we have today certainly and that's why Romans sometimes will add a dash of honey or a dash of fruit to it um so you know, maybe a little bit closer closer to, to something that, that is um, a mead beer than, than what we have today. Lots so. of nodding in the audience. Yes, sir, at the back. So what's the history of cider and does cider appear in any of these ancient cultures as well? Great question. Yes. Um, if you are waiting for a Julius Caesar reference, then, you know, take a shot um, because uh, <laughs> I'm about to mention Julius Caesar and the fact that um, we know that probably within Gaul around the 50 BCE, that is about a year before he crosses the Rubicon in 49. Um, he is writing down or having someone else write down for him um, his Gallic Wars, and we know that cider is being drunk, especially within the area of Gaul. Um, and this spreads to other areas, but it's not super popularized in other areas. I mean, Romans have fruit, they have apples. Um, it's just cider is not as, as popular as mead, um, and it's certainly not as popular as beer, and then wine is the number one most popular drink at that time. So great question. It's just cider is more popular in areas of, of um, Celtic culture um, around modern day Germany and the Rhine. But yeah, I think the earliest literary evidence and the archaeological evidence will probably go back much earlier. Um, but the literary reference is, is Caesar's Gallic Wars. So wonderful. Lots of thank you. So shouting out to our online audience. So thank you so much for the online attendees who aren't going to be able to sample with us. Uh, but uh, we've got two questions there and then we'll introduce uh, Peter from Wayward. So uh, Kat asks, um, they've heard that the ancient Babylon people ate their beer like a stew. Is that true? Um, okay, so uh, here's the thing. is like what we are told, and um, I don't know if Debbie Sneed is still in here, but she has done incredible amount of work on um, disability in the ancient world, but also on straws. Um, and uh, so what we are told, especially with beer that is being made in um, ancient 
Iran um, about 7,000 years ago. So we're thinking right around 5,000 BCE, thereabouts. Um, and they're brewing this beer that is very chunky. Um, and oftentimes you have to drink it with a straw. And so it, it a lot of the mash and, and the spices are rising to the top and you stick the straw down and you can drink through it. But we're also told that there's a lot of caloric intake um, in a lot of those things that are floating at the top of the beer. Um, and so occasionally you would dip a piece of bread in it, um, you know, that you can kind of scoop it up just like you do with pesto or, you know, something uh, that, that is, a, you know, a dip. Um, and, and so we're told that you can eat a little bit of that, um, but probably only a small amount. Um, so you're mostly drinking it through a straw. Um, and then if you really are feeling hungry um, and need something to nosh on, you can eat it off the top. So I think it just, uh, I, I would not suggest that, um, but but we are told that it's possible. And, and that certainly alongside beer, it adds to your caloric intake for your diet. So, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not something where you're eating it as your whole meal. Wonderful. So I'll leave the Q&A there. If you do have any follow-up from uh, for Sarah, as I said, she's very active online. She has an online blog called History From Below, which I think you should all check out, but you can definitely get in touch uh, mainly through Twitter, I think, to, to ask these kinds of questions. And she's always uh, so generous with her knowledge. So thank you so much, Sarah. And I thank think you did it. Might be the might be the key takeaway here for, for maybe for a wayward perspective if there's a beer dip in the offing in the future. <laughs> so thank Perfect. you, Sarah, and we'll leave the online guys up so that way you guys can uh, still listen in as I introduce Peter Phillip, uh, who's the founder of Wayward Brewery here in Sydney. Uh, Peter has travelled the world um, in search of little known beer styles and old world brewing techniques, and so uh, it's been really wonderful to be able to watch uh, Peter and Sarah. Uh, collaborate to kind of bring ancient brewing uh, of the Mediterranean uh, home to Sydney. So I'll, at that, I'll give it over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, um, and, and thanks very much to Sarah. That was really, um, really fascinating. Thanks so much. Um, so I guess it's a fair assumption that everybody here drinks beer, right? Is there anybody that doesn't drink beer? Everybody's nodding. That's great. Well, um, that's 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 pretty positive start to this. But um, you're in good company because um, I'm I'm not sure if you all know, but um, I'm gonna wander. I'm gonna turn this on so hopefully I can hear. Hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, let me see. Okay. Okay, can you hear me with this now? Um, so you're in good company if you like beer because beer is the um, second most popular man-made beverage after tea. And it's actually older than tea. So um, I'm delighted that uh, Sarah didn't go into some of the ancient stuff because while she's a historian with, um, with a keen interest in beer, I'm a brewer with a really keen interest in history. Um, so whilst um, you can probably trust what I say about beer, um, I'd take everything I say with, that's a historical reference with a grain of salt, I'm not a historian. I like to read a lot of stuff, but um, uh, it may not be accurate. So um, just take that with a grain of salt. Um, you know, did the Romans ever, ever even drink beer, right? So um, Sarah said, yep, answer that. Uh, uh, absolutely they did, but they were kind of wine snobs. Um, you know, um, Julian said, wine has aroma of nectar and beer smells like a goat. Um, but they did, they did because they uh, enjoyed what it did for them. Um, but it was very much something that was um, frowned upon or, or certainly, you know, you were a lower class if you, if you drank beer. Um, but I think oh, we've, got the, we've, we've got the evidence that they did. And although, you know, there's lots of, of anecdotal information that says that beer didn't actually taste that good, 
um, beer to that point had been brewed for thousands and thousands of years. I kind of think that these brewers figured this, up, this stuff out and they didn't drink beer that tasted like shit, right? So um, I think the, the Romans were just um, beer snobs and they just thought it was better. So, um, you know, the Romans said it's a beer fit only for barbarians. Well, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'll, I'll go with that. Um, and um, yeah, and I think what we did, you know, again, we have very little information on exactly how they made beer, but I think what you're going to taste in a little while is going to surprise you. It surprised me, actually. Um, so I think we can probably start passing it around. I mean, um, what did ancient beer taste like? Well, nobody knows, right? But we do know a few of the techniques that they used, which would tell us something about how that was. Um, so I hope you can read that. You know, it was sweet. There was no, there was no hops, no bittering agents, right? So hops are what we expect from beer today. If you don't have a, if you, if you tasted a beer, if I made you a beer um, without hops, it would taste very, very sweet. So they had to use other things to balance it. Um, you know, there's, um, the, the Romans tended to use more um, spices and herbs, as Sarah said. As you move into Europe, they were using things like even pine branches and uh, bits of, bits of um, stuff that they would forage, but certainly herbs, spices, fruits, and all those sorts of things to balance it out. But it also would have been sour, okay? Because most of these were wild ferments. Um, and you'll taste that definitely in the beer that, that we're passing around now. Uh, it's quite sour. Um, and I'll go into exactly how we did that. But it was wild yeast and bacteria. So wild yeast and bacteria, yes, there's, um, uh, you know, sometimes they, they did move on to using bread yeast, which would have been a little less sour. But those, those bacteria, that's um, um, uh, Britannomyces and things like that, would have made it sour. It would have been funky. Uh, and by funky, um, anybody, anybody tried a Britannomyces beer before? Okay, so, um, you know, the typical flavor descriptor of a Britannomyces is barnyard, also known as poo, right? Um, it's a nice way of saying, ah, oh, this tastes like, this smells like um, a barnyard. Um, so, yeah, funky, uh, if it, particularly if it, if it was aged a little bit. But as Sarah said, not many of these beers were aged. It would have been smoky, right? So Sarah showed you that T-shaped um, uh, kiln, right? So, you know, that's the way they would dry their, their malt, okay? So if you're drying malt with fire, guess what? It's going to get smoky. Now, I didn't add smoked malt into this. I think you'll probably thank me for that because sour and smoky and all these sorts of things competing with one another. But, um, but they could have also um, dried their malt in the sun. So I'm going with that one for now. It would have been warm. This is a little cool because I actually had it chilled uh, just to drop a little bit of the yeast out of it. Um, and I only took it out of the fridge um, a few hours ago. So, it, but it would have been cellar temperature, right? So this is kind of approaching cellar temperature. Maybe it's a little bit, a couple degrees cooler. Um, it would have been bone flat, right? Because there's no way to capture any of that CO2. Would have been cloudy. There's no filtration. Uh, they would have used what's called a turbid mash, which is basically something that, um, uh, you know, they're not, they're not doing a loudering stetch, uh, step. Um, and they wouldn't have boiled it probably. Uh, different, different evidence on that one. And wheat. Um, so... Beer was consumed as a staple. I mean, you would feed it to your children in the morning. That's what they would have for breakfast, right? Because it is nutritious, but it was probably only two or three percent. So Sarah mentioned, you know, the six percent and the twelve percent. So those would have been more um, festival and and religious uh, ceremony beers that were, you know, for the upper classes. The lower classes drank very very weak beer, and that continued. That tradition continued all through Europe. Um, uh, you know, particularly into uh, England, you know, it was like you wouldn't drink the water, that would kill you. But, 
you know, the beer was good, but it would be 2%. It's very difficult to get intoxicated on 2% beer. So yeah, great, huh? So it's really inspiring you to go out and get a six pack of that stuff, right? Uh, but um, now, I don't know how much I could talk about this for ages, but um, and I'm glad Sarah didn't because, you know, there is, if you go back further in history, right, to real ancient uh, prehistoric peoples, uh, mentioned that beer is, you know, the oldest beverage uh, invented by man. Um, some say it's 10,000 years, some say it's longer. And a lot of theories say that actually the brewing of beer led to the domestication of agriculture uh, or agriculture and the domestication of, of uh, animals. And you can see the way that that might have happened, right? Because basically you've got, you've got wild, um, wild grains, you know, um, while man was still uh, migratory, they still probably would have had some animals that were, that they were starting to domesticate and they would be, they'd be uh, feeding them some of this grain water would fall into maybe a, a feeding trough, okay? That barley or whatever they put in there uh, might start to germinate. Then a little bit more rain comes, fills it up, yeast settle onto it. You know, they go away maybe for a couple of days, go off hunting, and they come back and the animals are staggering around, right? They're going. And then there's this really, really brave guy that goes, or girl that goes, gotta have some of that, right? And they go, whoa, okay, come on over, party at my place, right? Um, uh, so you can kind of see how this happens, right? And how then um, the person who found that would say, well, get, let's get another thing for the animals. Let's feed them over there. Let's put, do more of this stuff, right? And then you might say to your friend, look, you do that. I'll go out and get the animal and I'll give you half of the animal if you give me half of your uh, stuff, you know, it's good stuff. Um, so, hello, that's commerce starting to happen, right? And then they go, wow, let's, let's, make, let's grow more of this, this, um, this stuff so we can make more of this stuff. Um, and, and they go, Right, well, now let's not migrate so much. Let's do this. So, you know, this is a clay tablet showing well, this, um, uh, you know, these dioramas are showing the early ways that they would have done that. You know, this is yeast, which is in everywhere. This is early um, uh, cultivation of, of grains. And that clay tablet is actually an account for beer. So some of the most, the earliest found clay tablets are actually accounts for beer. So maybe you're not totally convinced, but uh, yeah, beer is responsible for all civilization. You can go, <laughs> you can go back. I told you I wasn't big on accuracy, okay? But um, just go with that and it's a good, it's a good story for dinner parties. So Sarah, um, mentioned how beer is made. Very simply, it's carbohydrates in the form of grains. Um, so in modern times, we use malt, water, yeast, and hops. Uh, in, ancient, um, in ancient civilization, a lot of the time they use bread. Okay? Um, that was, that was uh, the main carbohydrate. There's a lot of uh, recipes that are based on, on bread, and I used a bit of bread in mine. Uh, or grain, bread, grain, combination, water. And then of course, they didn't know what yeast was. Um, so they used to say, God is good, right? They, they do their mashing and then they would go, let's let God do his work. And uh, God would do his work every time. So they go, wow, that's good. We're, we're, God is good. So today, uh, you know, we create malt sugars, um, maltose, through a mashing process, we add yeast to it, specific uh, varieties of yeast, and there's probably about 100 different yeast varieties used in brewing. Well, there's, there's many, many subspecies. There's two main, there's two main um, genus, but um, um, 
yeah, and we sometimes use bacteria intentionally. And then we, that creates alcohol and alcohol, we had, then we had uh, carbonation uh, to get, to get what we do, we have today. Um, I'll be around later if you want to ask me any other questions about, about how to, how to make beer. So um, I won't, I won't dwell on this because Sarah, Sarah spoke a lot about uh, the development of beer from, you know, the Romans, uh, the Egyptians. Um, and so I guess this is more about when I was researching this, uh, as I said before, there wasn't a lot of information of add this and do this in this quantities, right? So um, nobody can criticize me that I didn't brew an accurate beer because nobody knows, <laughs> right? But um, I, I kind of borrowed from a few, uh, a few things. So I'll talk about how, uh, how I did that in a second. So um, as Sarah said, you know, they would ferment in these clay vessels, so amphorae. And so um, I'm like, well, not many amphorae kind of hanging around, right? So what do you do? Well, I went to the clay amphorae uh, store <laughs> and, bought some, and bought some modern clay amphorae, uh, which, is, which is here, which is, uh, you know, very accurate. They used to use these plastic lids in, um, in so this is the clay vessel I fermented in. You'll see that in the video in a second. Um, with a little bit of modern uh, added uh, addition on the bottom so I could get the beer out. So how would a modern brewer make an ancient beer, right? Um, how did I make this beer? Well, the grist is, is the carbohydrate that the, um, that the yeast act on, right? So how did I do that? Well, I, I got some rye bread. Um, I got rye bread, you know, from um, a craft uh, bakery that, you know, was all natural. I uh, didn't use any uh, uh, olive oil in it or anything like that because that would um, that would interfere with with a few of the processes. I used a lot. I used rye malt as well because uh, I guess I went down a little rabbit hole of of, um, of looking at rye specifically. Um, you know, may, that may not have, I read some more recent stuff that said the Romans didn't use as much rye. So that might not be as accurate, but I did use barley as well. And I didn't use smoke malt. I was going to use smoke malt to give you that accurate, uh, but I just thought, you know, I didn't want people um, spitting it out. Uh, mash. So the mash is the process of extracting the sugars from the grains. So uh, I just did a single addition of 70 degree water and, let, and left it for two hours. Um, that I think is pretty accurate. There's a lot of talk about, you know, add water that's not boiling, but not, not tepid uh, in, in the research I read. So I think that's pretty good. Um, boil. So I don't think that they would have boiled in a lot of cases. Uh, I didn't want to kill you, so I boiled it. Um, um, you know, boiling is a good thing. So um, don't want people uh, getting sick. Um, and then I, and then, so this is my real interpretation of what, how to balance this out. Um, so I did a bit of research and kind of convinced myself that the uh, ancient Romans may have had, had access to oranges. Sarah will probably say they didn't, um, but um, anyways. <laughs> Sarah, no, don't, don't ruin it for me, please. Um, but I, I, I found some evidence that they, they could have had access to that at some point. I know they had access to cinnamon. I know how they had access to cardamom and chamomile, and those were easily accessible to me. So that's what I used in this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it was herbs, um, cinnamon. So has everybody tasted it? Yeah, everybody get the orange? And the cinnamon, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, I thought the cinnamon was going to be a lot more dominant. It kind of, it kind of came off a lot after the um, fermentation finished. Uh, I fermented it using a, a combination of two different yeasts, actually three different yeasts. Sorry, um, I used one. It's called the pike yeast, which is another ancient yeast. It's not uh, Roman, so that's not traditional. But I thought possibly 
it's the closest thing I could possibly find to uh, an ancient wild yeast. It's not really a wild yeast, it's, it's derived from a wild yeast. So anyways, that's not terribly um, accurate, perhaps. Um, the lactobacillus culture would have been, so lactobacillus is everywhere. That would have what, what, what gives it the sourness and Brettanomyces, you wouldn't have any effect from the Brettanomyces because that tends to take two or three weeks to kind of come to the fore in terms of the flavor profile. I did get a little chill just to drop it out. Uh, and I, you know, I moved it out of this vessel into another vessel that was easier to transport. This would kind of slosh around a little bit on my wife's, on my wife's lap in the, in the truck. Um, so making the beer, how did we do it? Well, this a couple pictures of a modern brewery. That's our brewery in Camperdown, which I um, encourage you to come and see. Um, uh, so what did we do? Well, hopefully this video will play. Okay, um, there it is fermenting. Uh, so the first thing I did is prepare the mash tun. I just put this uh, this mesh bag in there to help um, make the cleanup a little bit easier. Uh, there's me cutting up all the rye bread, putting it in with a bit of water, mixing it up. Um, so then I added the, the right amount of water I needed, adjusted the temperature, 70 degrees, and then added the malt, rye, and barley. Um, so then I was fitting out this uh, clay pot fermenter with some more modern additions so I could get it out of there. Uh, mashed it for about two hours. And then you can see it draining out there into the bucket. Um, that's the uh, that's the work. I added bitter orange peel, some herbs with which I basically just got from tea bags. So I got some herbal tea bags. I had some cinnamon, um, and boiled boiled it for uh, thirty minutes. Um, you know, normally you'd boil it longer if you were um, if you're using hops because you need that you need more time to extract the hop character. Um, yeah, just did it on the barbecue because we because it was such a small quantity. I in, I do intend to actually scale this up and do a 300 liter batch in our pilot brewery um, because um, it actually turned out not as terrible as I thought. <laughs> uh, so I just added the boiling uh, wort to the clay fermenter. Um, didn't burn my hands in, uh, amazingly, and. Uh, then you let that cool down, right? The quite yeast also has this um, character where it actually ferments quite warm. So I could actually pitch the yeast at around uh, 40 degrees, um, left it for four days to ferment. Interesting, you look at the, how the clay fermenter, some of the beers actually come through the fermenter. So showing you that it's actually, um, you know, the, the reason why these were good for fermentation is that they are porous and they let oxygen oxygen through. I think that's uh, about it. So um, how did you really like the beer? Great. Thank you so much. Um, so so um, I've got, I've got um, prizes for questions. I've got stubby holders. Anybody who asks a, asks a question gets a, a stubby holder. Anybody, the best question gets a six pack with a little um, holder. So there, I want to incentivize you all to ask, uh, ask great questions, get some com, com, uh, competitive stuff going. Um, and then of course, afterwards, um, we've got some beers over here uh, and I'm going to hang around and uh, have a chat and hopefully have a bit of socialization. Um, and and finally, finally, I do have some, for those of you who want to come and visit us at the brewery, I've got some uh, voucher here that'll get you a free beer. So Before we get into the questions on uh, in the room, though, and I appreciate there's many and they're very excited. Uh, uh, I just was going to say, we'll, we'll say farewell to our online friends at this point, uh, mainly so they don't get too jealous of the fun time everyone's having in the room. So once again, thank you so much, Sarah, for, for participating in this crazy project. And I hope the next time we can get you out here in person uh, to do some more work in this really fun and experimental way to make history alive again for everyone. So, so thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks everyone online who's joined us. Uh, wonderful.
and we will catch you soon. See you, Sarah. See you, Sarah.